And now I'm going to introduce Katie Hart. So Katie is our first speaker today. Katie is the operations director for Refed, and she has 15 years of experience in food systems and food waste reduction. She has authored industry and academic research and is passionate about uh, helping to build and grow successful and purpose-driven organizations and companies. So RedFed is a national nonprofit working to end food waste. Welcome, Katie. You can go ahead and turn on your mic and start your presentation. Thank you so much, Lola. Here we go. And thank you so much to Sequoia Living and your sponsors for having us here today. As Lola said, my name is Katie Hart and I'm the operations director at Refed. And I'm just delighted to be here to speak with y'all about food waste and how we can work together to reduce it. But first, we're just going to get a little bit more familiar with the topic. So just briefly to introduce Refed, in case you aren't familiar with us, as Lola said, we are a national nonprofit and we are focused entirely on food waste reduction. We have a sole mission, which means it's really easy for us to work on this one topic. But as we'll dig into it, it's very complex and it's not just as simple as, you know, don't throw that away. Um, but a little bit about Refed. Our vision is a sustainable, resilient and inclusive food system. And we're working to get there by leveraging data and insights, catalyzing capital and innovation and mobilizing stakeholder engagement. So all of these are really big pieces to a large national puzzle that we're putting together to help drive towards this better and more productive, in a good way, of course, food system. So what is food waste and, and what's kind of the scope of the problem? Well, about one third of food that's produced for human consumption is unsold or uneaten each year. And so you, you see a couple of different terms on this slide, but uh, just for simplicity, let's consider that wasted food. So about a third of food that is really meant for us to eat as people isn't eaten. And so this is excluding food or food products that might be specifically grown for fuel production or animal feed. So we're not even thinking about those types of food or food products. Um, but we're really talking about the food that was intended to end up on our plates at one point. And in this little pie chart, you can see that, you know, we've got a nice amount of food that is getting eaten, yay, but a really small amount of food that is being donated or recycled. And when we say recycled, we're talking about composting, um, food that gets processed through anaerobic digestion and transitioned into energy production, things like that, or animal feed, basically given another life that might not be for people. Um, and then you also see that band that is just outright wasted. Um, so not having some sort of additional productive life. But all of that to say is we've got about a third of our food system that's really not being productive in the sense that we want it to. And so the impact that this has is very significant, both in terms of the environmental impact as well as the social impact. So let's talk about the environmental components first. The environmental components are very wide ranging. And this probably makes sense because if you think about, you know, the breadth and depth of our food system, you know, whether here in the United States or globally, it's enormous. And some of these numbers might not seem big, but we'll dive into some of them a little bit more. 4% of our greenhouse gas emissions are just from that wasted food. And then we've got, you know, roughly around one fifth of freshwater cropland and landfill volume that's also just going to wasted food. That's really significant, especially when we think about some of these intersecting problems um, you know, around climate change in particular, like the droughts that are going on. You know, we have a lot of folks tuning in from California and our properties in California. There's a real issue with water. And if we're wasting all this water unnecessarily, that's a real big opportunity for us to be recapturing or simply not wasting 
some of that really valuable fresh water. We're also experiencing significant population growth, you know, around the globe. And there's so much information coming out around the need for increasing food production or crop yields, basically more and more being produced. But we're already wasting nearly a fifth of the cropland productivity that's being used. So that again is another opportunity for us to reclaim some of that uh, essentially unproductive cropland and utilize some of that food for better uses instead of it being wasted. And then the landfill, not only are we taking up space in landfills, which has social justice um, consequences in many situations, because those are often sited and located in low or near low income neighborhoods, um, but also because when organic material such as food rots in landfills, it releases methane. Um, and while this is part of our greenhouse gas emissions, methane is called a uh, short-lived climate pollutant. It is very potent, but it does live in the atmosphere shorter than things like um, carbon dioxide. And I know you guys are gonna have another episode that goes into a little more depth on methane and some of those climate science components. So I, I won't go too far into that, um, but it does have a significant impact in connection to greenhouse gas emissions. And so we would like to see less volume going into landfills, as well as less organic material in general, so that we're creating less methane. And just to put some context around that first point, the 4% of greenhouse gas emissions, especially since that's that smallest number we had up there, 4% of greenhouse gas emissions is the equivalent to nearly one fifth of the cars on the road. So if we were to reduce food waste, and let's say we could totally wipe out food waste, get rid of that 4% of unnecessary emissions, that would be the same as removing one out of every five cars on the road. That's hugely significant. Even though that 4% seems so small, it's a really big opportunity for us to make big changes, even if we just moved the needle on one or 2% of that. And there's also significant social impact. So I know I spoke about the fact that this is food that's meant to end up on our plates. That is really important because at the same time as we're wasting all this food, we have neighbors that are food insecure. And I, I think this probably is um, not lost on this group of, you know, Lola talked about some of the needs of the community, but this is a great opportunity for us to be more thoughtful about how we're using our food, to look at greater opportunities to be donating more, especially as we think about solutions in kind of retail or food service sectors, maybe less so for in the home. Um, but it's also an opportunity for us to improve systematically our food system and look at ways that we're making the system exclude certain members and think about how we can create a more holistic environment that benefits all of us while wasting less at the same time. So this is often a, a picture that is brought up in conversations around food waste because it's really striking to think about the fact that, you know, about a third of our food is wasted, but you know, one in every six of our neighbors is probably going hungry and might not know where their next meal is coming from. These are problems that we can solve simultaneously. And so if we look at where food waste happens, the important message, I know there's a lot going on in this slide, is that it happens everywhere and we are all responsible in one way or another. The average American grossly underestimates how much food they waste and often, uh, according to some actual consumer data and some survey research, thinks they waste less than the average American. So I, I know that that's a lot of averages thrown in there, um, but ultimately we all aren't doing so great and we all think we're doing better than we're doing. Uh, so you can see here kind of this top bar chart uh, going from left to right. We have about a fifth of our food being wasted on farms. A lot of that is product that gets left in the field. Um, maybe it was not economic to harvest it. 
Um, this has intersections with topics like immigration or just economic markets. Sometimes it is simply more feasible to plow under that field of blueberries instead of harvesting them. Um, it could also mean be caused by the fact that that product um, didn't make the quality or grade for the place that it was going to be sold. So let's say the cucumbers over ripened and they were really big that season. In retail, especially, we're used to seeing food that looks a certain way. And this has come from a combination of marketing as well as consumer preferences. And, you know, especially for people, you know, young folks like myself, you know, we've grown up thinking that, you know, all cucumbers are straight and they're seven and a half inches long and they're all beautiful and they have no imperfections. I think we all know that is not true. Every cucumber has its own beautiful shape and its individuality. Uh, but unfortunately, it's um, the current state is that it's not uncommon for fields or yields to go unharvested because they don't look the way that they should to sell on the shelf. So that's another reason why fields may be left unharvested. And then we also, um, another example is when there's major shocks in the supply chain. We saw this a lot during the onset of COVID when supply chains were completely disrupted. We do not have a very elastic food system. And so that was another instance where we saw mountains and mountains of food just being piled up on farms because there was no outlet for it. Then moving down the line, we have 14% of food being wasted at the manufacturing um, stage of the supply chain. A lot of times this is byproducts or trimming. So manufacturing is where those big carrots are being trimmed down to baby carrots. Um, food products are getting chopped and processed into ingredients. So you end up with a lot of little bits and pieces. Um, Fortunately, we have a lot of innovations going on in the world of what's now called upcycling, where we see folks taking you know, those trimmings or those byproducts and creating new products, giving them new life, um, and really rescuing what used to be waste and manufacturing into really new business opportunities. So it's a win-win-win um, for the folks who are seizing that business opportunity for consumers who get you know fun new products and the environment because that food is no longer being wasted. Just a couple of examples of this. Um, we're seeing a lot of breweries start to take their spent grain from the brewing process and convert that into flour for baking. Um, we're also seeing bread or bread crusts being turned into beer. Um, in a couple of other examples, we've seen the cherries that um, grow around the coffee bean. There's a beautiful little red cherry with a fleshy skin. Uh, it's called the cascara bean. We've seen that turned into teas and juices, uh, also being um, ground up into flowers. Instead of being just put into a pile of kind of waste, uh, which is what we used to see at coffee washing stations. Um, and there's a whole industry really rising up in the upcycling space to take advantage of so many of these opportunities. And now we're getting into the part of the supply chain that is really most relevant to us as consumers. So consumer facing businesses and homes. We really account for the vast majority of food waste in part because we're very particular. Um, also in part because food has taken a longer time to get to us here um, and many, many other reasons. And so this includes everything from retail to restaurant to food service, which I know Ben and Grace are gonna go into further, as well as at our homes. Um, and food waste happens here for so many reasons from over ordering to over purchasing. Um, it might spoil because you kind of forget that something was in the back of your fridge um, or you simply you burn something. I do that all the time. Um, and the best part about this is that we can all be part of the solution. So there's no shame in the fact that we're wasting something today, but there is an opportunity for us to do better. 
And what's most exciting about all of this is that more than half of unsold or uneaten food is still edible. So I know I talked through some of the causes there, but this graph um, gives a, a really great view of that to really emphasize that most of the food that goes to waste is not because of health safety concerns or because it's spoiled. So you can see that little um, slice there that is spoiled, um, but less than 3% of food goes to waste because of food safety concerns, for instance. About 14% goes to waste because of spoiling. But outside of that, a lot of the reasons that food gets wasted leave it to still be edible, which means we could be repurposing it into other products, we could be looking at donation options, or we could be finding other solutions that are still getting it to human consumption. So at ReFed, we conducted analysis on, you know, what do we do about all of this and how do we really organize the sector and the food system to implement solutions together? Um, taking those three pillars that I mentioned about our work before around data, capital, and stakeholder engagement, and put them into a somewhat easy to follow roadmap for everyone to follow. And we came up with this seven part framework. And I'm not going to go through all of the components. I am going to dive in on reshape consumer environments today, um, just because we are con all consumers here. And that'll be an exciting one for us to talk about. But this was also a really exciting process for us because it, it opened our eyes and so many others across the food system to just how many solutions there are. We looked at over 75 solutions. We ultimately were able to get enough data to model 42. Um, and we also looked at a whole suite of best practices that we may never have data for, but we want to make sure that people are practicing them. Um, and I know, you know Grace and Ben will talk about some of these more from the, the institutional side. And some of the key findings that we found were pretty stark. Um, and these are, are three of the really big ones. First, more than half of the produce, specifically produce, left behind on farms in 2019, which is the year that we conducted our initial analysis for, is edible. That's enough fruits and vegetables to provide every one of those one in six neighbors with four servings of fruit and veggies a day. So that's an enormous amount of highly nutritious, delicious food. Now, you know, the theoretically is thrown in there because, you know, it's, it's one thing to have, as you can see in this photo, a, you know, a nice big truckload of cucumbers. It's another thing to logistically get those harvested and distributed and handed out to the folks who can eat them or prepared and whatnot. Um, so there are some solutions that need to be in place to make sure that food is getting to people. There's also an incredible amount of food left on plates at restaurants. 70% of surplus in food service comes from customers, you know, me, you, not eating everything we're served. A lot of this comes down to portion sizes. Since the 1970s, portion sizes has increased dramatically in everything from cookies to lasagnas to you know anything, you name it. Even Julia Child's The Joy of Cooking, the quantities for recipes have gone up, but the serving sizes have stayed the same. And you've seen trends like this in so many different places. Um, even the average household plate has increased in size over the past few decades. And then as we saw in, in one of the earlier slides, the residential sector is still the largest source of overall food waste and has an even bigger greenhouse gas footprint given the added energy required to get food from farm to the home. So I alluded to that a little bit when I, I talked also about food just taking a little longer to get to our home, but every extra step in the supply chain means extra energy, extra resources, extra greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and you also have to think about the fact that we're using energy to store and cook our food at home. So there's a lot that goes into this. And so I know at the beginning I mentioned, we have a, a very narrow focus at Refed, but it's such a complex topic because there's so much that goes into it and so much that goes into our food system. And so you, you might think to yourself, 
you know, why aren't we doing more about this? But we have quite a few challenges. You know, the food system is very complex. And I have a couple of examples of, you know, why we don't see more movement on the topic quite yet. Uh, you know, misalignment of cost and benefits, for instance, with date labeling, we see an area where manufacturers will have to invest in new date labeling processes. Uh, whereas retailers and consumers will actually reap the financial benefits from that. And so there's a whole host of reasons within organizations, within regions and so on, why we're not seeing more movement. This is a great point for us to um, do it, to transition. So Katie, okay. we are, we are gonna have you part of the panel discussion. Um, we'll go ahead and transition over to having Ben and Grace join us. And then we'll get back together and we'll talk about some more um, tips on what our viewers can do to make an impact here. Thank you so much. And so I, I will leave you if we have a lot of progress to be made, um, but we're making some strides in that direction to bring this little graph down. Thank you so much, Lola. Thanks, Katie. All right, so I'm going to introduce Ben and Grace, and we're going to launch a poll. So you heard some statistics from Katie, and I am going to um, go ahead and, uh, Ben and Grace, you can turn on your cameras. And Ben is uh, the regional dining director with Morrison Living, who, are, who oversees all of the dining for Sequoia Living. And he's been in the food industry for over 10 years, specializing in um, built from scratch menus. And then we have Grace, who is a nutritionist and a dietitian who has over 10 years experience in health and wellness education. So welcome. Thank you for both joining us. And our first thing is we want to launch a poll and ask the audience. So audience, can everybody see the poll? Oh, yes. Okay. So what percentage of food purchased in the average household is wasted each year? This is a little bit different than what Katie said at the very beginning. Um, she said that, uh, well, I'm not going to tell you what she said, but she was talking specifically about all unsold and uneaten. So this question here is specific on the food purchased in the average household. So we'll give everybody an opportunity to make their selection. Is it 5%, 10%, 30%, 50%? So I know Grace and Ben know the answer to this question, and they're going to reveal it in just a moment as soon as everybody has a chance to take the poll. And Katie's presentation was so interesting, and I mean, it really opens our minds to how much opportunity there is to utilize the food that's, that's available or being grown for us. Um, so this is, this is a great conversation. I can't wait to hear what Grace and Ben are going to share on what we are doing today at Sequoia Living and how we can take that even to the next step and have more households participate. Okay, so I'm gonna end the poll and I'm gonna share the results here. So the majority of people who took this poll believe 30% of the average household's food purchased is wasted. Grace, what is the actual number? The actual number is C, 30%. Excellent. Good job. Most of you got that. And I'll go more into that. So thank you for having me here as well as Ben. I'm going to share my screen. So the average American household of four loses at least $1,500, $1,500 each year. Um, and they're purchasing this and simply throwing it away. So what a waste is that? We're gonna be talking a little bit more towards the end of this presentation on how, different tips on how you can prevent that. So let me go to my agenda. So thank you, Lola, for introducing us. We will be talking about company-wide initiatives, menu planning, inventory management, monitoring waste, 
and then we'll summarize and then at the end talk about applications. So within the Compass Morrison Living Company, we have a lot of company-wide initiatives. Here's a little summary on what we've been doing as uh, the Compass Group in the United States. This is our sustainability roadmap. So the four pillars are we strive to create a circular economy. And what that is, a circular economy, it seeks to keep resources um, such as products, materials, and energy in the economic system for as long as possible, adding to the highest value. So we're finding ways to reuse products to keep that value. Um, and these efforts can help maintain to reduce negative effects on the climate, biodiversity, as well as reduce pollution. The second pillar is we always prioritize ingredients from local and diverse artisans. Our strategies are rooted in reducing our carbon impact, and we are leading the fight against food waste. So the Compass Group, let me go back to the slide, Compass Group, um, it makes efforts since 1995. Um, there are many modest steps such as reducing trans fat in frying oil, reducing processed foods. These foods are not only bad for our health, but they also, um, they use a lot of energy to uh, process these foods. Some noteworthy events in the Morrison Living Sustainability Timeline include in 2019, it received the Sustainability Environmental Achievement and Leadership Award for Carbon Food Footprint. Footprint. And in 2019, also committed to reducing food waste by 50% by the year 2030. Um, 2021, they announced a net zero carbon emission goal by that same year, 2030. Uh, and by this year, we've had 100% of milk be free of growth hormone and other hormones that you may have heard of, like RBST. 91% um, of seafood is from sustainable sources. 100% of yogurt is free of artificial growth hormones. And 93% of chicken and turkey um, is without the routine use of human antibiotics. So this is the bigger picture, but we're gonna be moving into now the smaller picture. And let's talk about specifics on what sustainability means to Morrison in terms of fish, eggs, uh, and dairy products. So Compass has a commitment to the humane care of animal farms or farm animals. We purchase only human farm animal care certified cage-free shell eggs nationwide. Caged eggs are often confined in spaces where they can barely walk, they can barely spread their wings or turn around. Um, so going for cage-free eggs helps with um, treating animals more humanely. Um, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization also abbreviated as FAO, has estimated that 70% of the fish population is overused um, or in crisis. And Compass Group follows guidelines set by the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Program, and 100% of contracted seafood is supplied from environmentally responsible sources. Um, in addition, in dairy, uh, growth, hormone has, growth hormone has been shown to be detrimental to the well-being of the animal and it may also be harmful to human health. So all of our cows and contracted milk vendors have been certified to be free of these growth hormones. We also support local businesses. Um, and this is especially important for our future food system because when you purchase from places that are overseas, there's a lot of resources used in terms of distribution, transportation, um, to get it over here. So local is really important. And uh, now that you've heard about some of these bigger picture items, we're going to be talking, I'll be talking about the day-to-day -day operations, uh, preparing meals for our residents in our Sequoia Living CCRCs. So on this um, slide, you could see this is the cycle of food, food production that I'll be talking about. This is just a general diagram to show you just that this is a cyclical process. 
And the first step is menu planning. Um, the second is inventory management. And the third is monitoring waste. So you can see this as sort of the beginning, middle and end, but it also cycles in back into the beginning. So everything in food service is determined by the menu and the recipes. It determines what is purchased. It determines labor hours, the types of service wear that we need, and of course the total cost of the plate. So everything is determined by the menu. Um, after going through each steps, um, you can see monitoring waste will give us insight on what can we adjust for the menu, which then cycles back to step one. So let's go into detail on step one, menu planning. This is an area that I, as a dietitian, uh, am most involved in. So this is the planning phase. And we use tools such as Webtrition. You can see the symbol for the, the program on the top right. We use this to create cycle menus so that we know that ingredients will be used up on a weekly or monthly basis. We can use this tool to forecast the right amount of food. We can also use it to make shopping lists, um, to populate the exact amount of ingredients that we need to procure. Um, and at Sequoia Living in San Francisco, where Ben and I spend most of our time, we have a four week menu cycle. Um, and each week we're reviewing ingredients and recipes removing slow selling items. Um, in addition, we're including a lot of plant-based foods, which is really also important for the environment. So a lot of plant-based, vegetarian, and vegan meals. Um, for those who, of you who are interested in eating meatless, we have um, access to products such as the Impossible Meats, Beyond Burgers, Bean Patties, Garden Burgers, uh, in addition to a huge variety of different produce. We started doing a marketplace which showcases a variety of crudite, seasonal fruits, and chef curated sandwiches. These are the first things that residents see, so we're really trying to promote more plant-based eating and eating more lightly. Um, portion control is really important, so we also use Webtrition to calculate volume and also assess if these meals meet nutrition needs. Um, our residents expect quality ingredients, so seasonality is important, and we pro prioritize local ingredients. Um, and we are also on our order guides through Cisco. Um, many items are marked with a sustainability icon, and these are items that we'll prioritize in order to also um, select for foods that are going to be most beneficial to our um, environment. So on the client facing end across all of our buildings, it's really important to market these initiatives so that we can educate our residents to make the best educated choices. And hopefully it will encourage them to be more mindful and minimize waste. So now Ben will talk about inventory management and monitoring waste, um, as well as summarize uh, this presentation. But before we continue, I just wanted to plug if there's any sort of questions on anything I've talked about so far, feel free to add it into the question box. I think I saw a question on how was the 30% arri arrived at? It seems extraordinarily high. Um, that's a very good question. It's probably based on a poll that was collected. Um, I can find materials for that, but that's a good point. I think ultimately what's important is the application and how we can reduce that number overall. We will get um, a follow-up email out to everybody that has some of the information that you've heard of today, and we'll make sure to quote where that comes from. Um, Jim also had a question. He asked, what's your relationship with Thompson? And I'm not familiar with Thompson, so that might be yeah. another company. Maybe take a moment just to explain who Compass is, how Morrison is uh, within the Compass group, and then how that fits into Sequoia Living. So I work directly uh, within the company of Morrison Living. This is a smaller sector of the umbrella company of Compass. Encompass is actually an international um, company and they have a U.S. section, U.S. branch. So it's huge. It's a 
Morse and Living, I would say, is one of the most um, top of the line um, food service management staffing companies within the long term care sector of healthcare. So um, I am a Morse and Living employee as well as Ben. And we partner with clients such as Sequoia Living to staff the dining services. Awesome, thank you, Grace. Um, and a huge thank you to Sequoia Living for your valued partnership with Morrison. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Ben Bianchini. I'm the, the system director for the four Sequoia Living communities. Uh, so I oversee the food service at each of the CCRCs and Viamonte in Walnut Creek. Um, I would like to take the time to talk with you a little bit about our culinary operations in each community and what we do to manage our inventory in an effort to prevent waste. Um, similar to what Katie mentioned earlier, uh, but up to 10% of food purchased by restaurants is wasted. Um, this is because too much stock is purchased at one time, which typically leads to spoilage. So inventory management is extremely important. Uh, this is because when too much stock is purchased all at once, it, it's spoiled. Uh, so what is inventory management in the kitchen? Um, it's ac accurate procurement of the quantity, spef specifications, and items, whether it's meat, produce, beverages, dry products, frozen items, even non-food items such as cleaning supplies, in cooking or food service equipment. To prevent waste, it's important to manage proper storage temperatures, keep storage spaces organized, and maintain stock to a minimum. There are some key practices, including a consistent inventory schedule. Uh, this involves consistent staff, usually two people who review ordering mistakes and um, hold each other accountable. Um, maintaining the right culture for our kitchen staff is also extremely important in managing our inventory. Uh, consistent scheduling, this is the, the opposite of having standing orders, which leads to purchasing too much product. Generally, inventory is taken regularly on a monthly basis. On a smaller scale, par stock items are maintained about three times a week. So stock, stock is kept low to ensure frequent purchasing of the freshest ingredients. And produce doesn't have as long as of a, a shelf life and over ordering uh, can really lead to wasted food. Um, a consistent staff. So inventory is managed by the same staff each month. The executive chef and the storeroom clerk really work together on this. Uh, and creating the right culture. It's important to rotate products so that the oldest products are kept in the front and used first. Another name for this practice is FIFO. Uh, so first in, first out. Uh, this is important not only to minimize spoilage, but also for your health and food safety. Uh, other ways that we can maintain our inventory um, consist of you know, managing the volume, um, creating a specialized menu for special events, and making sure that meals are individually plated rather than buffet style. So now that we've talked a little bit about inventory management, we'll now talk a little bit about waste management. And this is what we do in the kitchen at all four of the communities. Um, in the Compass Group as one of as one of the largest food service corporations, um, we're, we're primarily one of the companies that need to lead by example. So a few things that we do is we, we celebrate an annual food waste day to educate and highlight the role of each of our staff members that they play in the sustainability and minimi minimization of the food waste. Uh, not only are we focused on food, but we're focused on the excess usage of single-use plastic and paper utensils, cups, containers. Um, we've done a really good job encouraging green containers for residents 
which is something that we consider best practice. Uh, these played a huge role during COVID. Um, at some locations at the beginning of COVID, we were using up to you know, $20,000 of paper and plastic products. And one way that we were able to find a sustainable solution was with these green reusable containers. Um, we've also worked to reduce the number of disposable containers by um, campaigns such as what we've done at Sequoia Living Portola Valley, where residents are able to come into the dining room and use their insulated mugs. And um, we've actually reduced the number of paper cups that we're using at Portola Valley by giving each of the employees an insulated thermal mug for their beverages. Um, our teams do regular in services with staff to reduce the number of reusable housewares, including the, the plates and utensils. Um, we've also reduced the number of tablecloths that we use, um, which saves water. And when planning, it's also important to consider a secondary outlet for ingredients if they are leftovers. The next slide says that we can really add up our, our waste throughout the year. About two to 5% of what we produce is wasted. Um, in the kitchen, we do our best to utilize every part of our produce. And with the guidance provided from the Morrison program, Waste Not, uh, vegetable, vegetable scraps are saved and um, a lot of the product is used for stock, stocks and stews. Um, on food waste day or stop food waste day, uh, waste zero buckets are placed at the at each prep station in the kitchen and staff compete to have the smallest amount of production waste. So that's the waste that comes from cutting fruit, the rind, um, also when you're, you're trimming beef and poultry. Um, so it's something fun and interactive for the staff. Um, at some Sequoia Living communities, our culinarians have even made dog biscuits using vegetable scraps in a program that we call Waste Not Wag a Lot. Um, other dishes that are great for repurposing leftovers include salads, sandwiches, soups, pastas, and frittatas, which are, are extremely popular in our kitchens. So Ben, um, yeah. uh, we're going to we're going to transition to because you this is the perfect point to transition to giving the audience some tips on how they can um, purchase uh, and re and uh, make sure that they're not wasting food. So let's go ahead and invite Grace and Katie on the screen so that we can um, talk a little bit more about some very specific things that we can do as individuals. And I loved the, I loved those cards, the recipe cards that you just showed up on screen. Those are wonderful. So let's start there. Let's talk about um, how to repurpose leftovers or other um, vegetable items and different items that we may have that we don't want to throw away. So who would like to go first? And I do want to tell the audience, if you put us on gallery view, you can see everybody's face at the same time. Answer that question. Um, there's a lot of different ways that Ben had mentioned earlier. I find that the easiest ways is putting things that, putting it in meals that just mix well. So things like frittatas are really great for vegetables that are left over. Um, if you even prep it in advance and you just throw it into different types of foods like fried rice or meatballs or putting on your pizza, adding them to quesadillas. They're absolutely a simple way to repurpose some of those leftovers. Um, if you have leftover fruits, you can turn them into jams or you can simply freeze them or add throw them into smoothies. Those are just two food groups that are especially um, easy to repurpose. Katie, you had some ideas earlier when we were talking about upcycling. What would be one of your favorite things to, to reuse or repurpose? Yeah, I... You know, you hit on a lot of them there, Grace. Um, you know, this is, you know, just a, a step different from a frittata, but also, you know, omelets. I, I personally love eggs. And so really 
anything like you're saying that you can kind of chop up, mix up, kind of get get a little fun and creative with is wonderful. I know one of our our hosts also mentioned tacos are a great opportunity to to throw things in. Um, you know, and nachos, you know, also just another spin on that. Um, and and then I'd also add in, you know, soups and stews. That's another great way to, especially if you have a, you know, a crock pot or a slow cooker, you know, just throw everything in there. And that's another great way you can use up meats or bones and even be creating your own broths and, you know, use up onion peels, even the things that you don't think are edible. So um, lots what, of great ways. What what are some ways that we can store these items before reusing them? So ways that they don't spoil in the refrigerator. Oh, so I, I'm happy to jump in first, but I'd say your freezer is your best friend. So many things can be frozen. Um, you know, like celery is one of the few things, you know, and lettuce, things that have a really high water content do not freeze particularly well. Um, but there's so much that can be frozen. Bread, for instance, a lot of people don't realize you can freeze bread. So really becoming familiar with your freezer. And oftentimes it's just as easy to, you know, take something out of the freezer and defrost it as it would be to take it out of the fridge and prepare it. So I always encourage people to you know, become familiar with your freezer. Um, and also for, um, for some of us, like I, I live in a two person household portioning really helps because it can be really common, even as you know Ben was talking about from the institutional perspective, um, to take something out and then feel like, oh, you know, now I've got six servings of something. Uh, you know, what if you had packaged up that those chicken legs before and frozen them individually into the portion sizes you need? That's always a really great way to help you in your your meal prep later on in the week or the month or the year. I freeze things for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. I would definitely piggyback on that as well. And the freezer is so helpful for um, meal prepping. So if you have any leftovers, you could just save them. Often they store very well. And then on a busy night or day, you can just um, pop it in the microwave. Um, other ways that you can also store things really well in the refrigerator is having um, silicone covers or beeswax covers. These you can find in Walmart or um, most stores like Whole Foods. And it's a repurpose, you can reusable seal on um, covers for bowls. I've even seen like a cover for avocados that have a little belly, like a little dimple in them so that it holds the pit. So if you look for it, they're definitely out there. Grace, would the, the beeswax covers be a replacement for buying saran wrap or, or aluminum foil? Exactly, yes. Okay. So then we can reduce our, our shopping waste um, basically by buying reusable covers. So let's talk about shopping habits a little bit. Ben, um, tell us more about different types of sustainable products that we should be aware of when we're out in the grocery store. I think there is something very simple that many of us drink on a daily basis, and that's coffee. Just making sure that you're sourcing your coffee from a sustainable source, and it's typically labeled on the bag, and you can see it on the front or the back. Uh, pretty much 75% of what you can purchase in the supermarket is going to be sustainable when it comes to coffee, but you want to make sure. So we have some questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to read those to you now and whoever wants to jump in. So I know it's good to know that you're emphasizing a plant-based diet or plant-based menu. Someday I see you have three choices for non-vegetarians, but I can't find anything for me. I'm a vegetarian. I want to see at least one choice, not just potatoes, pasta, each meal. Um, so this must be from one of our residents. And I know that when I eat at the Sequoias, um, I've had the Impossible Burger, which is delicious. And there's uh, miso soup with tofu. So there are options out there. But for vegetarians in particular, Ben and Grace, what does the Sequoias do to ensure that, they, that there's enough variety and options? 
That's a great question. And I know at all four of our communities, we strive to make sure that we have options for the vegan and vegetarian uh, residents. And um, our, our chefs take a lot of pride in uh, creating items that are plant-based. And many of our soups are made with coconut milk as opposed to heavy cream. Um, so for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, there's always gonna be an entree that's available that's vegan and vegetarian. And there's also going to be one of the two soups that's vegan and vegetarian. Thank you, Ben. Um, Jennifer asks, how much leftover food can be reserved, re reserved or used in another dish? How do health department restrictions affect this? We definitely have a policy for those um, safety sanitation questions. Uh, we keep reheatable foods within three days. And so we'll toss that, but often we're really measuring production so that there isn't much excess. And on that same day, we're often making meals for our own staff and they will typically eat it within one or two days. For anything that cannot be reheated, such as salad bar items, we're keeping just for two days and then we will toss them. So I think it's also important to note that um, many of our, our staff members are union and part of their union contract is that they get a free meal um, each shift. So it's a great way to utilize our leftovers and the staff gets, you know, there's a little incentive for them to come to work. They get a nice meal. They get to eat what the residents are eating 90% uh, of the time. So um, it's a win-win situation there. Fantastic. So we are about at time, and I know there's a few other questions in here, and we will make sure that we answer your questions individually in a follow-up email. Um, but let's let's just go round table here real quick. What else would you like our audience to know about food waste and eating sustainably? Katie. My favorite tip is to tell people to start monitoring and measuring what they're wasting at home, or you know, just become more aware. And the way I encourage people to do that in a really simple way is, you know, hang on to your receipt after you go shopping or you, know, you can print it out or put it on your smartphone and, you know, just grab a pen or a highlighter. Most of us have that at home and just keep track of what you're wasting or what you don't use all of. That way, next time you put your shopping list together, you can look at that list and say, I don't actually need two eggplants. I just need one or I only need to buy the half gallon of milk this time. And it really helps you become smarter about your shopping. And it's almost like you're putting a little built-in computer into your shopping process. Thanks, Katie. What about you, Grace? Um, I would say there's so many things that you can do, but definitely start small. Uh, things that you can be consistent with and whether it's bringing your own grocery bag to the store for those of you living at home or you know, changing out your, the way you store food and just being more mindful about how much you buy. Um, one of my classmates back in the day, she was really into farmer's markets and supporting the community. So she uh, started doing monthly CSA boxes and CSA stands for community supported agriculture. So you're taking a lot of, you know, very ripe and ready to eat foods that may be left on the farms. Um, instead, you're purchasing those things and getting it delivered right to your front door usually. So try that out, Some try out something new. Thanks, Grace. How about you, Ben? A lot of the residents and, and individuals on this call, they can, they can really get creative, similar to what our chefs do on a daily basis. Um, many of our chefs, they incorporate a chef special of the day to help utilize unused products. And it's always something fun and exciting. And I think if you have leftovers at home, you could do the same. You can incorporate uh, a little special for yourself. And I think that would kind of break up the monotony of, of certain items and you can get creative and look up recipes with what you have. Well, and um, meatless Mondays, that's a great way to try to reduce your, your meat intake. Um, in fact, we have uh, one of our one of our chefs, Chef Hellman at the Sequoia San Francisco is a vegetarian. 
and she's su super into health and fitness. And, um, and so, you know, I, I love, I love seeing the different creative meals that she comes up with. Now I wanna, as we close here, I wanna let everybody know that we do have another Legacy Talks um, episode coming up on June 29th, Wednesday, June 29th at 2 p.m. And the Legacy Talks is designed to not just educate and inform you, but also to, to create stewards of our environment, right? To, to have you share some of the statistics that you learned today with your friends and family. So while some of you do live in a community where your food waste is, is much smaller than somebody living in a home um, that has, you know, four or five people living in, in it, but you do have family and friends who are part of larger households that could utilize some of these different saving techniques. So anything from using the beeswax to buying uh, sustainably sourced coffee, those are great great suggestions that you can give people or for Christmas, buy everybody sustainable coffee as a gift. So um, again, thank you to Grace and Katie and Ben and everybody who's been on this, this Zoom call today. I really appreciate your participation. Sequoia Living appreciates you coming together and wanting to learn about these topics. So we will see you not next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after for our next Legacy Talks. Thank you very much.